started. As y'all know, man, the Minding Your Business podcast is brought to you each and every Friday afternoon by Brooks Brothers Consulting. Uh, Brooks Brothers Consulting started in June 2013 with my brother Philip and I, and we really specialize in business edification through not just coaching, but uh, channels for financing. So when your business is looking for um, various needs for financing, whether that's uh, vehicle purchases, rental property, commercial property, um, equipment, uh, you need factoring, sales, leasebacks, whatever it is that y'all need from a financing standpoint. I'm your guy, uh, 16 years in, in banking, so I understand the landscape, I understand the lingo, I understand what you need when you need that alternative to uh, dealing with you know banks and credit unions. So uh, I've got a network of private lenders around the country who look to do nothing but provide and infuse capital to small businesses uh, and individuals. Uh, so it's uh, we work in all 50 states. Um, I'm currently, I mean, I've been closing deals even from right here in Memphis, man. I've been closing deals in Key West, Florida, um, Atlanta, Nashville, Dallas. I mean, you name it. And that's why I've missed y'all these last few weeks because um, I've been busy doing that. But if you're interested in looking at ways to, uh, you know, not just add debt to your business or to your, your credit report and that kind of thing, but how you can structure debt instruments to acquire assets that then produce revenue for you. And that's what we're about. So we're, just, we're not a debt company. Uh, I'm not a debt broker or anything like that. Um, I like to work with you to make sure, one, if you need the capital um, and it makes sense for your business at the time, then we're going to do that. And we want to get you the best rate, the best terms, all that kind of thing um, for your company so that you can continue to grow your company by using lending as, as a, a, a resource for you and not a hindrance and not a liability. So we don't want to just add to your liability section. We want to add to the asset section. So Brooks Brothers Consulting, uh, give me a call, 901-808-3801, 901-808-3801. You can give me a call or ron at brooksbrothersconsulting.com. This is episode 50, baby. So we want to crank up the music, man. We want to get that thing rolling. Welcome to Here Let's Go Back, 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 Back. So yeah, 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 yeah. So again, welcome to the Minding Your Business podcast for episode 50. I'm your host, Champ Ron. And man, I'm just excited on today. Today's June 22nd, 2018, man, on a Friday. It's beautiful outside. Like I said earlier, for those that uh, weren't on the podcast, I was telling the Facebook Live audience that just got back from the Minority Contractors uh, event over here in Whitehaven. One and over only barbecue was the uh, food sponsor, and I got a chance to run into some familiar faces, man, and uh, you know see what people are doing with some of the contractors. Actually, had uh, networking opportunities where got an opportunity with uh, one of the contractors to do some business uh, from the alternative financing piece, like I spoke about, and for us to be able to help him um, got a roof need. Uh, with the client that I was able to make that connection, man. So that's what it's about, and that's what the podcast is about. Entrepreneurship, real estate, and the best practices from trending news. There's no business like minding your own, and so that's where we are today. Man, last night, man, we celebrated episode 50, which is what this is, um, but reaching 50 episodes for this particular podcast, and we had some folks that came out. Shout out Dominic Lawson, uh, Donald Watson, John White, man, uh, Man, Darrell, a uh, good frat fraternity brother of mine, uh, several people that came out. Uh, I know there was some weather on last night here in Memphis, but uh, some you know people had a nice group came out. Man, we were able to check out the first round of the draft. And you know, let me say this in terms of the podcast, man, because 
you know, people know me for, you know, doing business and, and certain things, particularly on the finance, economic side of the house, real estate, that kind of thing, man. But uh, I'm not a, a big speaker or I didn't major in communications and, and that kind of thing, man. So I'm not, you know, I, I started this podcast as a way for it to be a platform and to share knowledge and to share best practices for other people. And so I appreciate everybody that has given great comments, people who have uh, been critical of the show in the effort to help me get better with my delivery and things like that. I need all that. You know, I'm a guy with, you know, thick skin. I didn't get into the game to be soft and flimsy and (laughs) all that kind of thing, man. You know, you got to have. Uh, you don't need gator arms, but you definitely need to have gator skin in this game. And so I really appreciate, you know, those that have given feedback, good, bad, and ugly. It's all been an effort to help me get better and help this uh, podcast platform be able to deliver value. But um, definitely shout out to my guy, Dominic Lawson. And I've said this on many occasions on this podcast and previous episodes and publicly that <clears throat> I was inspired by Dominic's show, which is The Startup Life. Uh, he's somewhere around 75 episodes and that kind of thing. And I was inspired to do this actually by him and the platform that he brings uh, when it comes to the startup life and entrepreneurship. That's a great show. You should make sure that you subscribe to that uh, wherever you listen to podcasts, uh, The Startup Life by Dominic Lawson. But, you know, I was inspired to be able to do this and to create this platform, man. So shout out to him. I consider this the the little brother to uh the startup life and uh you know i'm i'm big enough and humble enough uh to be able to do that and you have to recognize those that you know help you know put away for you not just because they're big and have lofty titles or because they're older than you or dominic's younger than me but um they don't have to be older than you or have this big account or have a wikipedia page for you to shout them out Right and recognize people. So just because they're on your friends list don't mean you, you can't recognize them, right? So that's what I want to do. And thank you, Dominic, for that, man. All right, today's episode. Uh, last night, as I mentioned, we were watching the NBA draft, man. And what I want to do today on this podcast is I want to be able to connect um, from a business standpoint what the how the NBA draft process parallels with what business owners should be doing as they assess talent. So, you know that for decades now and the NBA draft process has gone through its different um uh evolution phases and things like that. It at one point in time it used to have like five or six rounds and you know now it's down to two rounds. I actually entered the NBA draft myself in 2000. So I entered the 2000 NBA draft, um, completely unheralded player. After one year at the University of Memphis, I appeared in four games, really didn't have no stats or anything like that. This was, um, for those that are in Memphis, this was during the uh, Tick Price era. So Coach Tick Price uh, was the University of Memphis head basketball coach. Um, I don't have to get into all the particulars as to what happened with that situation. Those that know, uh, they know. It's like Pusha T said, if you know, you know. <laughs> so uh, I entered the NBA draft after that, was not drafted. I did get a chance to go to San Antonio uh, for some time during that summer. Uh, that was a great experience. Uh, I kicked myself often because I, I didn't take advantage of the contacts that I made there in San Antonio at that time. Um, but I came back and finished at the university, went through the University of Memphis, got my degree, and and kept it flowing from there. But the NBA draft is um, the process for teams in the NBA to be able to bring in young and, and new and fresh talent. And most of the your their stars in the NBA uh, originated from the NBA draft, so they were drafted by teams that were in what's called the lottery, and those are the first thirteen teams or so that select uh, oftentimes based on a number of different factors. But again, what I want to focus on today is what that process looks like for the business owner. Because as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, uh, you're always assessing talent, which begins with yourself, right? So you're always assessing yourself, your talent, your, your skill and your will, and your ability to accomplish whatever task needs to be accomplished. Because keep in mind, when you start a business, um, you really what you're doing is once you, s- you sign up and you begin starting and forming the idea, um, the first person you hire is yourself. 
right? Even as the business owner, because you're the only worker, you're the only employee when you first start, in most cases. So you're the first employee. So automatically, you become a business owner, you become an employee, and you become head of HR. (laughs) All that. When you start a business, it's not just giving yourself the title of CEO and all, which the CEO is actually just the highest ranking employee, right? A CEO reports to a board of directors, which can be fired by the board of directors. So y'all running around with the CEO title and all that, just be careful because I'm, I'm asking you, who's the chairman of your board? And if you say you, then I already know what's going on. <laughs> so, so anyway assessing talent begins with yourself and then you have your vendors that you work with you've got your uh any employees that you hire whether 1099 w2 any of that kind of thing um and then you've got either uh, when you're bringing in co-owners or other owners you have to assess that talent when you're bringing in investors you got to be able to assess that talent right and let me say this about from investors because this week um i've got a uh a friend is a mutual friend for some of y'all or, or contact or acquaintance or however you want to call him. And I'm not going to shout his name out because I, I don't get into the mess of it. But he uh, he made some great mistakes this week from uh, a business standpoint that um, you have to be willing to listen to the coaching sometimes. But um, when that does not happen and you decide that you're going to operate in a certain fashion, in, in a negative fashion, and, and he's someone that has been a guest on this podcast in the past, and and that kind of thing. And you know, you got you got to be careful with who you do business with. You got to you got to vet things out. And when people haven't vetted things out, and they're just going to go out and they they oversimplify investment, and they tell you, well, give me a thousand dollars, and I'm going to turn it into a million. You know, it's always going to be a play on greed. But you got to look at and vet that out. There's very few investments that's legitimate that's going to convert you in 17 months from $1,000 to $1 million. Because if that was the case, everybody at Warren Buffett and his great-grandmama would be doing it. So that's not really going to happen. So be careful with how you invest. I'm not here to knock brothers and things like that. If anything, I want to help build them up. But I'm going to call them when they're wrong. And this brother was wrong. So... Um, the way that it was handled, the way he allowed it to be handled uh, was wrong, and the way he handled the aftermath was wrong. So just be careful with that when you talk about investing. So anyway, n- not to go too down, too much down that path, but when you talk about, again, the NBA draft, y'all, again, you, you've got the areas of where you need to assess talent, which begins with yourself. Last night in the NBA draft, DeAndre Aiden from Arizona was the first pick in the draft which most people felt he would be, right? That was, you know, you know, pretty well known ahead of the draft. The interesting thing about last night's draft was after the number 1 pick, most drafts, you know, you you kind of know the first 3 to 5 6 picks. You know, you kind of pretty much especially the day before the draft or the day of the draft, you kind of know. But this particular draft, man, after number 1, after DeAndre Aiden, you had no clue who was going to be next. You know, it could have been whoever. Well, so number two pick was Marvin Bagley from Duke. Um, 6'11", 235. You know, he was a monster down there at Duke. He played with a lot of talent. Um, Then you had Luka Doncic, who had gone through a lot of controversy. There, You know, how people are about foreign-born players and things like that. So there was controversy with him. Then you had Jaron Jackson Jr., who was drafted by Memphis Grizzlies, who I'm going to get to in just a minute. And then you had Trey Young uh, at number five by Dallas. And then Dallas and Atlanta decide that they're going to, uh, you know, do a deal and trade. So Atlanta traded Luka Doncic to Dallas, and then Dallas traded Trey Young to Atlanta. So they did that kind of deal kind of all around the Grizzlies. I felt that they were trying to be a little disrespectful to to the Grizzlies by, oh, y'all, y'all just going to do a deal around us while we, we sitting there in the middle. So I almost thought the Grizzlies should have jumped on and, and drafted Trey Young just to mess that whole thing up if they wanted to be petty. But So anyway, that's just, you know, if you got the petty bones in you. But um, So, you know, you can go on. Everybody's seen the draft results. But leading up to the draft, it, so if you go back to last season, 
And I want to tie this into business because I think it's very important and very critical. So last season, there were a number of teams that once they were out of the playoff hunt, so once they were no longer competing for a playoff position, many of the front offices decided to do what's called tanking. And so for those that are not involved in sports and basketball, and particularly the NBA, um, tanking is where, because the, the draft lottery is based on the number of ping pong balls, just like any kind of lottery or any kind of gambling. And so um, your chances go up the more ping pong balls you have uh, at play. And so teams decided that in order to get more uh, options for ping pong balls, they would lose more games. So it's a very simplistic type strategy that can have its benefits. The Philadelphia 76ers went through uh, five or six losing seasons to really terrible to be able to get Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons and kind of build that team, get some free agents in there. And then they won 52 games last year after losing a ton every year before that uh, for half a decade, you know, um, which can alienate your fan base and that kind of thing. But so you, you've got, you know, the players that were, you know, drafted. I, I mentioned those first five. And so teams leading up through the end of the season were assessing these players once they were no longer in the draft. Businesses owners do that too. You're, you're always assessing talent as a business owner. Um, whatever your business is and whether you've got again let's start with employees because that's what most people are going to recognize early um, when you're assessing talent for employees you may have good employees today or you may have average employees you may have not so good either way even if you got the best of employees they either should be moving up or they're moving out they're either going on to other opportunities and um and whatnot so what you're hoping is that you're able to bring them up as you build the business but you should always be looking for talent because you never know when someone's going to be ready to move up and or decides to move on from your company. So you always you can't be in a situation where some you know a key person leaves in one of your processes and you you have no clue on how you're going to backfill it or you're just going to go on indeed.com or google you know you're going to go to one of these monster.coms and just you know place a job post and then get all these applications. You should always be assessing talent. So you should always be around where talent is. And you should always encourage as people are coming in, your customers, whether you're business to business or business to consumer, whatever that is, that you're always around talent. Because you never know where you know, talent can come in and and you know boost up where you've got opportunity or where you can mitigate a risk or build up your company or solidify a strength. Right. And so that's what the NBA draft is for these teams. They need to mitigate a risk of where they have a gap. So, for instance, a team that doesn't have good point guard play or has average point guard play, but has really good um, wing and big man play. They may decide that obviously they're going to look for a point guard in the draft. They need a young point guard. Um, They need to maybe they've got an aging team and they need to get younger. Uh, because, as you know, uh, basketball is a young man's game for the most part. And so um, you need to be able to always be assessing talent. So NBA teams have scouts and they're always assessing talent from the college level, overseas, various you know professional leagues and things like that. So as a best practice, you should always be doing that in your business, even if your business is a solo business that is just you right now and, you know, yeah, you're you're not quite ready to to take that on because you don't feel like you've got the um, the money or the process down pat. That's fine, but you should always be assessing your talent and starting with yourself. And so you should make sure that you know YouTube's a great channel for a lot of free education. There's a lot of different webinars and things like that. But you should invest in your talent um, and always assessing that. So the NBA draft parallels a lot with that, with your business of that assessing talent. Now, if you think about, you look at the NBA and look at who are they were assessing talent. I told you that DeAndre Aiden was number one, right? All right. So after that, it became a little bit of a, you know, it wasn't real clear on who's going to be next, right? Because it ended up being Marvin Bagley. But leading up to the draft, people were talking about Luka Doncic could be number two. They talked about 
Um, Michael Porter Jr., who ended up going, I think, 14. He fell a little bit because of some back issues or concerns um, that he could even jump in and be number two. Um, you know, there was some talk even Jared Jackson could jump in. So people were all over the place. So it wasn't really settled. Some of that for smoke screen. Some of that was legit. Um, the point of this is um, there's a lot of pressure on these NBA teams, right, to have – um, success through the NBA draft. And there's a reason that I think that is, and I want to tie this in, this piece into business because I've had this discussion with other business owners and there's been agree, disagree, that kind of thing. Here's Champ Ron's, here's my reason for why I think there's so much pressure now on the NBA draft. It's the same in the rest of the world. As the population has grown and you've got more people, so you've got more bodies, because more people are being born faster than they die. Uh, and people are living longer. So there's more people. So I take the, I equate that to the NBA. Uh, in the NBA, in my opinion, there's more talent in the NBA than there's ever been. In terms of guys with the athletic ability and the prowess to go out and play NBA basketball. Th- that's better than any point in time. And I know... Old heads, you know, everybody's error was the best, right? And there's going to be the people who think everything yesterday was better than anything today and blah, blah, blah. But the fact of the matter is, is that we should always be getting better. So to say that we haven't gotten better would speak to a lot of things in society, right? So, yes, we're going to get better because everybody today was watching everybody from yesterday and figured out how to get better, bigger, stronger, faster, whatever. So the talent level of guys as errors keep going keeps getting better and better that's okay that's what should happen so there's no disrespect to someone from the 60s 70s 80s 90s that the guys today are better now here's the thing they're better in terms of the physical attributes to play nba basketball here's what happens with the nba and here's what happens with the rest of life even in business is there's, yes, there's more talented people, but there's less winning talent. Did y'all get that? There's there's more talent that's out there, but it's not winning talent. Here's how I'm defining winning talent. These are folks that help you win games, essentially. So in the NBA, there's a lot of guys. There's a lot of guys in the world. Y'all go to your neighborhood. You go to... You know, uh, the gym, you go, you you watch guys play five on five. There's talent all over the place. There's a lot of guys who can play basketball at a very high level. But every guy is not able to transition that into playing winning basketball, meaning that um, my grandmother could take a basketball and dribble it up the floor with nobody guarding her, right? So just give her the ball. She just dribble it and walk up the floor. All right. So in the NBA, there's some things. There's a lot of off the court stuff that goes on. Plus, when you get in the game, you go down to the FedEx Forum. So there's 18,000 people sitting in the stands. There's three referees. There's cameras everywhere. There's lights and there's the pressure to play. It's not like you in the, uh, you know, the the tiger den somewhere, you know what I mean? Or in the um, what they call the hyper or whatever. And you just playing and nobody's really watching you. There's nobody calling fouls and. You know, all this, there's no lights, there's no cameras, you know. But when you turn the lights and the cameras on and the other coach has been studying your game and the other players have been watching you on film, and that's what's changed is it's not just coaches know what's this and what's that. It's that they're watching it. So it's not just hypothetical through somebody's mouth. They're actually watching your behavior. They got what's called analytics. So people are, are looking at the math. How often does Ron go right? How often does Ron go left? How often does Ron call the pick and roll? How often is Ron on the wing? How often is he at the top of the key? What's his shooting percentage with a hand in his face? What's his shooting percentage from the wing, from the corner, blah, blah, blah. So there's all this information, right, that people are using to best do what? Prepare. And prepare by assessing the type of talent to offset. They've been spending three or four years now trying to assess the talent on how to stop the Golden State Warriors, because they won three out of the last four championships. So what are teams doing? They're looking at the analytics. They're trying to see how can we stop Clay from shooting? How can we stop Steph? How can we stop uh, Draymond? How can we stop Kevin Durant? How can we stop Andre Iguodala? And on, on, and on. And 
other than you know, them giving up the 3-1 lead to Cleveland in 2016, no one's really f- kind of figured that out enough to beat them four out of seven times in a series, in a playoff series. And so you're always doing this assessment of that, but there's a lot of talent out there in the NBA. There's a lot of talent in business. But you know, if you take it from a business standpoint, um, there's a lot of information. People can learn things about business. They can learn how to set their business up. But there's not a lot of businesses that are really scaling and growing because there's not always the winning talent that's out there to do it. There's not always the winning commitment. There's not always the winning resources or how to seek those resources. And so you've got a lot more people, I think, around. And so it's, it's cataclysmic, but there's a lot of parallels, y'all, with that. So that's just my opinion. So that's why I think, you know, when you look at the NBA draft, there's a lot more pressure on teams because and there's a lot of things. There's collective bargaining and there's a lot of things. So I'm not trying to oversimplify. There's a lot of things, social economic and things that are different that change landscapes. Right. So I'm not trying to sit here and oversimplify. But you got to know that the talent is, is not quite there to help you win. You know, a lot of guys you know want to do what James Harden does, but then there's just one James Harden, and everybody can't do that on every team. Sit there and dribble the ball, and step back and travel, and, <laughs> you know, and shoot the three and and drain it. Everybody can't do that. Now, a lot of guys can walk into the gym here at the Y and the, the community center and stuff and do that here, but everybody can't do that with three referees watching, another coaching staff, twenty thousand people in the stands, millions of people on TV cameras, um, uh, Rachel Nichols running all over the place asking you questions and Hannah Storm all over, you know. So everybody can't do that when it's that kind of environment. So it's the same in business. Everybody can't do that when the lights are on, people are watching the business, resources having to be done. Like I talked about earlier with my guy that's in the, the pickle now with the investment piece. You know, everybody can't do that. You know what I mean? Everybody don't have the, the type of pedigree uh, to be legit out here and to really grow their, their business. Everybody just doesn't have that. Although there's more people, just like there's more people in business. Like I've said on this podcast, you know, 2008, 2007, you have what's a lot of vigilante entrepreneurs. <laughs> you know, you have entrepreneurs that they were working jobs. How many times have you heard this you know story? They were working a job. They hated it or they got fired and they vowed. They were like Bruce Wayne. They vowed to rid Gotham City of crime. Right? So they're going to start my own business. F it. I'm going to start my own business, work for myself. I don't want no boss. And a lot of that started, you know, at least for this recent generation at 07 08. So you got these vigilante entrepreneurs. Right? So the talent in the NBA. Um, it's not quite there. So it remains to be seen what some of these guys are going to be able to do, right? Some are going to be successful. Some are just like every draft, right? Stephanie Gatewood says, which Stephanie, I, I need to get back with you, lady, so we can get on your show. Stephanie Gatewood show. I'm looking forward to being a guest on her show. Stephanie says, quote of the day, circumstances don't make a person. They reveal him or her. And it does apply to sports. Yeah, it applies to sports and business. So, definitely, uh, Stephanie, thank you so much for that. Circumstances don't make a person. They reveal him or her. Yep. So, that's what happens as you're assessing talent. Right? Let me speak to that on something else that I shared um, with some Facebook uh, friends. Uh, that Something that I do. So, here's the best practice from Champ Ron. Um, when I'm assessing... so. This can apply to sports or to business. So take this in business. So I learned from a mentor sometime, and I've been able to apply this. So when when I'm looking to bring on talent, so I'm looking to hire talent, I'm looking to uh, align myself or affiliate myself with someone, or I'm looking into a partnership or whatever that is. Um, Let's take it, uh, I'm hiring an employee, right? So those of you, some of you are in HR and some of you are hiring managers in your jobs and some of you are business owners that hire people and things like that, vendors, things like that. Here's what I do and here's what I've learned to do because like I talked about earlier, there's talent and then there's winning talent, right? And what you want to bring onto your business is winning talent, okay? Winning talent. So here's what happens, and here's what I do. 
in an interview setting, because there's so much education and people have gone to college and people have an understanding of the interview process, they know how to do a lot of BSing, right? So they know how to draw up their pretty resume and they know how to fill out your online forms and all that kind of stuff. And they know, you know, you know most people know how to show up dressed right and looked the part and things like that and he, yes sir yes sir yeah mr brooks yeah yes sir yes yeah mr brooks yeah yes sir yeah i, I can do anything you ask me to do yeah yes sir <laughs> you know what i mean here's how you cut through the bs right so what i do in my process is i initially do a phone conversation because i want to hear you speak and i want to make sure that you know you can you know articulate yourself well enough on the phone then I do like a Google Hangout or some kind of video conference, right? And there's a couple things that happen with that video conference, man. And this is 2018, so I don't buy all the BS because just like y'all on here watching me on Facebook Live and folks use FaceTime, they've been using FaceTime for years, right? So when they give me that bull about, uh, I don't know how to use Google Hangout, I don't know how to do this, and I don't know, you don't do nothing but click on the link. So I already know you're not innovative enough, you're not hungry enough. So some of that is just I just want to see if you and if you don't use it, I want to see are you willing to get in there and learn to use it, because that's the kind of winning skill set that I need in my business. I need people to think innovatively and independent without me telling them do this, click here, do this and that. They'll say, hey, we're going to meet two o'clock on Google Hangout. You can get it on on your phone or wherever you've got a camera device, you know, your tablet, your laptop. And some people are like, cool, no problem. Even if they don't use it, they just say, hey, I'm going a, I'm to a figure it out. It ain't that hard. It's Google Hangouts. It's Google. It's all free. Just jump on. Right? And say, so I may say, okay, I'm going to send you the calendar invite, and I want you to click on the link in the invite, ex- you know, accept the, uh, the invitation on your calendar. And then when it's time, all you got to do is click the link. And I guarantee you I get somebody that, I didn't see the link. I didn't know this. I didn't know that. My device done this. I ain't, you know. And most of the time what it is is they got all that junk on their device, all them pictures and all them videos and fight videos and naked pictures and, you know, past exes and all this kind of stuff all on their phone that they won't delete, <laughs> especially if they got that iPhone. And uh, they're limited on their space and they ain't delete enough stuff to let the thing download. So all this kind of stuff comes in as you review their social media, see kind of what they value, how they post, all that kind of thing, which they do do. And employers do do that because I do that. And because I want to be able to see, you know, what spews from your mind, how creative is it, how cool is it, how innovative is it, how stupid it may be, how dumb, whatever it is. I need to know that because that gives me a glimpse into people. But. Um, so, uh, you know, I go through the Google Hangout, the video conference that allows us to see each other face to face without running all over the place um, and kind of be cognizant of time and things like that. So it allows us to go and I want to be able to see how they handle themselves through the video. Are they distracted? Um, can they focus in on me, answer my questions directly, ask me questions, things like that. So it allows me to get through all of that and, and also be efficient. So once we get through that, the, the next layer, the third and final layer, layer is we go to breakfast or lunch, right? And here's what I do. And this is something as a best practice y'all may find interesting is I – so we go to a restaurant. I get there early, right? And I tell the manager, hey, um, just, just call him um, uh, Jack. So – I'm meeting Jack, and I'm looking to bring Jack into the company, into the fold. So I tell the manager at the restaurant, hey, listen, I'm, I've got um, my other party. Jack is going to join me. Whatever he orders, I want you to, to mess a piece of it up. We're going to pay for it. I'm going to pay for it. So you ain't got to, you know, relax. I'm going to pay for it. So we're not playing that. But I want you to mess some of it up. They'll do it. Um, and here's why I do that, because while we're there, um, when Jack comes in and Jack orders something and naturally something of it's messed up, either something's cold, they leave something off, um, you know, whatever that is that they do. I want to see his reaction to that. Right. For a number of reasons, y'all. Um, what you're not going to be able to BS is your personality and your temperament. Them two things that is hard for people to BS for long enough, because at some point. 
something that's going to strike you, that's going to hit that natural of who you are, you're going to respond how you naturally would. So here's what it's got to be. It's got to be a situation where you let it be messed up, and I'm just looking back to see how they respond. And there's a number of ways that people respond, right? They can get angry and upset, and they could be the type of person that looks at a server they look down on people, so they a server or someone subservient to them, right? And so they get angry and upset and they pitch a fit and they want to talk to a manager and they want to jump on Facebook and tell everybody not to eat there and all that kind of thing. So you get that crowd that gets very angry and frustrated. I mean, for just a simple mess up or a simple mistake, um, you get those that are ultra passive. That take that mindset like, ah, oh, well, you know, the meal won but twelve dollars, so you know they they make a mistake. They back there working hard. They did. It's the best that they can do. It is what it is, you know. So you get the ultra passive person. You, then you, and you get a myriad of these different responses, right? Um, and so what I use that for is I want to get a sense of again, you know, that temperament because that's how they're going to react to things that. They don't necessarily like or they don't necessarily agree with. Right. That's how they're going to react to things when I'm not around. Right. As the owner or as the manager, as the director, as the executive, whatever that is. So I'm getting a glimpse into their mindset. So I I share that as a best practice, because um, if you try that, it's kind of a creative way. But. I want to you want to know how people how they view other people. Do they see the server as an equal person? Hey, man, we're we're in this together. You're you're a person. I'm a person. You know, you got a job. I got a job. You know, I'm not looking at my titles or, you know, what I think are salary differences, maybe or not or whatever. I mean, all, all that's out the window. I'm here. I'm a customer and I'm patronizing the business and I see this you eye to eye. Um, or am I someone that's looking down on people? You know, you're the server. You should be doing this for me. I'm a paying customer. That's true. You know, but there's a certain way to handle things. So you'll be surprised at how people, and I've had people completely, I've had people literally do excellent on the phone, excellent on the Google Hangout, or if it happens to be a face-to-face interview, and then bomb, completely bomb that when we get to the restaurant. And their their soup comes out cold, or it doesn't have enough chicken in the enchilada, or or what you know whatever it is, right? And so that's just the best practice nugget that you should try. That you should try that personally too. Okay, that works not just in business, you know that also works personally too. Y'all single folk or want to be single folk, <laughs> want to be single folk. When, when y'all are out here and y'all are dating and things like that, do the same thing. Right. Do the same thing. You know, get there a little early. Tell them to mess the food up. That's going to tell you how he or she responds to things. Right. What they value, how they view people, what their temperament is. Because I tell you, if they if they quick to cuss out that server, they will be quick to cuss your ass out. <laughs> I don't for sure. Once you especially once you get off that high horse of the lovey dovey stuff. Right. How she how she or he response to management and response to that environment that situation if they someone that has to pop off on everything and they got to be heard they got to be loud and all that just know that when, when if you mess something up or something they don't quite agree with or see eye to eye with you their response is going to be times 10 because see in that restaurant there's people looking around and stuff like that but when you at home ain't nobody looking but it's just y'all so Again, that when you're you're vetting out these folks, you know, and y'all going out to eat, y'all go to Roof Chris, y'all go to all these different places here in Memphis where y'all decide you're going to be. Try it out. Just say, hey, um, you know, when they ask for the salad, just don't bring it out, right? Because you know, you just want to see how they respond. You go pay for it anyway, but that's worth investment. That that extra twenty dollars or ten dollars, it can save you from a lifetime of hell. <laughs> Or at least a few years of it. So uh, these things all work in parallel, y'all. Business, personal, with the NBA, whatever that is. And so these NBA teams, what have they been doing 
since the end of the season. They've been interviewing these guys. They've interviewed DeAndre Aiden and Marvin Bagley and Luka Doncic and Jaron Jackson and Trey Young and everybody else. They've been interviewing these folks. They've been watching them play, looking at them in situations to see how they respond. Right? You want Because you want to know. If you're going to draft a guy and you want him to be potentially the face of your franchise, you, know, you need to know how he responds. You know, how does he respond to adversity? It's a big thing. So when Stephanie Gatewood gives a quote that says, here, circumstances don't make a person, they reveal him or her, I agree wholeheartedly. So thank you for that, Stephanie, because I agree with that wholeheartedly. So Jamal Whitlow, what's going on, brother? How you doing? Reginald Johnson, Darian McGraw, how you doing? Karanda Soar. What's going on, girl? Stephanie Gatewood, I've mentioned. Darwin, what's up? D Banks, Sean Banks, what's going on? Cousin Liso, South Carolina, right there. Lou, Lou Garza, man, my guy. What's going on? Zane Samuels, what's up, man? Zane, the cultural chef, doing his thing out here, man. Um, you check out them slap your mama uh, beans too, man. With uh, Zane, y'all make sure. You know, matter of fact, inbox Zane and uh, order you. Uh, some of that uh, slap your mama beans. If you're on the podcast, get on Facebook. Look for Zane Samuels, the cultural chef. Deverick Watson, man, credible concepts. I've told y'all about him, man. That's that's my credit guy. Uh, should be your credit guy, and you know he needs to be a part of your team, man. Make him part of your team. You need credit people part of your team. Xavier Johnson, Mark, what's going on, man? I like to shout everybody on the Facebook live. Uh, most definitely, man. So thank y'all for tuning in. So, you know, so those are some of the best practices, man, when you talk about comparing the NBA draft to, to the business. So there's a lot of assessment that goes on and you got to look at what your philosophy or your strategy is for talent, which that's one of my last points. So every team, all 30 teams in the NBA may have different strategies. Some of them may have similar, but they have different strategies, whether they draft for fit whether they draft just the best talent, whatever that is. It's the same for your business. What's your talent assessment strategy and talent acquisition strategy in your company? Starting with yourself. What talents do you have to have that are mission critical? Which ones are nice to have? And everywhere around. But you've got to know what that is. And you've got to be able to assess that. You've got to have your strategy and philosophy. So when they go in and they're assessing all these guys, right, they got to know, are we drafting Luka Doncic because he fits on our team? Or are we drafting Luka Doncic because he's the best talent? We just like to have the best talent. We make it, try to make it all fit. And there's there's arguments for all of it, right? That if you listen to a lot of sports shows, some people, they argue that all, all the time, just like they argued tanking. Here in Memphis, the Memphis Grizzlies went 22-60 and 60 last year. They lost 60 games, missed the playoffs for the first time in about, what, eight years or seven years, whatever it was. So there were some people that were for the tanking, meaning, you know, losing games. You know, you know not, I don't know if it's almost just trying. You can't really tell players to not try, but being OK with losing the game and hoping that the team loses to get a better draft selection. And there were people who were against tanking who said, no, it. You know, it can mess your culture up and, you know, uh, it, it's not good for the young players and blah, blah, blah. So you get people all the way around on both sides. My personal opinion is I'm not a guy for tanking, and, but I come from the player standpoint. I played the game. So for me, you, you don't go into any game ever in life. I don't go into any business. I don't go. In, I never went into any game. I don't go into no relationship. I don't go to anything with the sense that I'm gonna lose or to try to lose or, or be okay with losing. And I think that's a lot of people. But you know, I don't care if there's a benefit to it at the end of the rainbow. I just don't care for losing. I just don't because I think culturally, even if it means you don't have the best draft pick or the best this and that, I think you just set a bad precedence when you go out with the mindset um, that losing is okay because there's a positive down the road. You're going to take losses everywhere. They, they, there's no NBA team going 82 and 0. Just like there's no business that's winning every contract and doing everything right and having perfect customer service every time you turn around. There's not. Right? 
No business. Nobody's going to be perfect out here. Right. But to go out with the mindset that you're going to lose just so I can get a top draft pick and all that, that's just not my thing. But for some people, they make that argument and I understand that argument. I respect that argument. Personally, for me, I'm a culture guy. I like culture building and I, I like the culture of if we go out and we get beat. Or we go and get our ass whooped, it's because we went down fighting. We may have been outmatched with talent or size or skill or whatever it is. In business, you get outmatched with, you know, maybe capital or resources or knowledge or whatever that is. You get outmatched, right? That's fine. Getting your ass whooped is okay, right? When you're going to go out there and fight, right? Because there's learning in the ass whooping. <laughs> Some of y'all done got your ass whooped. They all over there laughing. But there's 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 a message in the ass whooping, right? But when you go out there with the, the intent that you're just going to let somebody just pound on you because there's a benefit on the other side, I just I'm just not a, I'm not wired that way. And I'm a borderline millennial Gen Xer. I was born in 1981. So I I hit right there on that line. I was born January 81, right on the line of millennial and uh, Gen X. I just wasn't raised. I just didn't have that mentality. So there were some teams that were like that. They didn't get the top draft pick. They might have drafted in the NBA somewhere 14, 15, 16. For me, that's better than going and becoming number one. Yeah, you get a chance to get the top player, but you still didn't have to rebuild your culture. Because winning is a, is a cultural thing. Winning is something that's not just the players. It's the coaches. It's the guy selling the popcorn. It's the ticket guy. It's the social media girl. It's everybody. Winning perpetuates throughout your whole organization. Same in your business. Your business don't win just because you want to win. It's because everybody social. Your vendors want to win. And, and they do the behaviors that lead to winning. You know, you're, the people that work for you do the behaviors that lead to winning. So winning is a cultural thing. You know, when when you just perpetually going to lose just so you can get the top prospects and things like that, what the Philadelphia 76ers did was risky because they spent five or six years losing, you know, trying to lose so they can get these picks. They're up now, so they're an example of how it can work, but they had to have a lot of things go their way and they still made bad choices. Jahil Jahil Okafor and some folks that didn't pan out to even get there. And then what do you do to your fan base? Philadelphia is one thing, Memphis is another, right? So what do you do to your fan base, particularly in a small market, when you go lose 50, 60, 65 games year in and year out with the hope of tomorrow? I'm just not for that. So Anyway, you have to have your different philosophy when you're assessing talent, in your, whether it's in your business, whether it's the executives in the NBA, and there's a lot of pressure. Here's where the, it, there's also similarities. In the NBA, take so those here in Memphis, they're familiar with the Grizzlies, so Chris Wallace. Many have said that if Jaron Jackson don't pan out <laughs> with, the, with uh, the Memphis Grizzlies, that uh, Chris Wallace should lose his job. I'm not one to say who should lose their job for anything. You know, because most of y'all, y'all don't want that said about y'all. So I'm not going to say that about a person, whether they should lose their job. That's for the people that hired them. You know, they want to keep them, they keep them. You know, that that's what they want to do. That's what they want to do. Hey, you know, I can have an opinion about it, of course, but I'm not one to just come out and say people should get fired and this and that. But you gotta you gotta be accountable for your decisions, just like you are with your business. You're accountable for your decisions, right? So if your decisions um, don't pan out, or uh, they're not in line with the culture of the organization and the mission of the organization, then there's consequences for that. Just like in your business, if you make the wrong hire, I, and I've done that, I've made bad hires. When I've in in banking as a, as a um, manager, director, as an executive in the retail area, I've made bad hires. People that didn't pan out for a myriad of reasons. Some of them my fault from my misassessment of their talent, right? And there's consequences for that. Big, small, however they are. Same for these NBA executives. Like for instance, um, Dallas made this trade for Luka Doncic. If Luka Doncic turns out to be a dog. And he's Luka Donkey instead of Luka Doncic. <laughs> hey, 
whoever you know, um, you know, uh, Mark Cuban's go look at you know the, him and and everybody else that assessed that talent and said, hey, you know, what are we doing here, fellas? What are we doing here, ladies? We misrepresent this talent, and it sets us back. It can set you back in your business because I've had that in my own business where I've hired people. When I had the consignment store, when I had Entre Memphis, I've hired people, and they've been bad hires. You know, or they turn out to not be what I assess them to be. Again, for a myriad of reasons, but this is why it's so critical today because there's again there's a lot of talent out there, but there's not always the winning talent. There's not people that. When you when you know hitting the mouth, they can bow up and continue to press through. There's not always a lot of people with that kind of heart. There's not the kind of people always that when they don't get their way, they can still perform in a role. There's a lot of people in the NBA or that play basketball out here that can on, they're only good when they sit there and pound the ball 50 times and dribble around. But everybody ain't gonna get a chance to do that. So can you play a role? Can you understand the offense? Can you rebound? Can you handle the ball? Can you make the right pass? Right? Can you defend your position? You know what I mean? When the other team's pressing, can you rise up to the occasion? Can your game elevate when the other team's players elevate their games? Everybody can't do that. So it's the same in business. Everybody's not capable of elevating their game. Some people, they are what they are. And that's fine. But you just got to be able to assess that. <laughs> That's the key. So I, I share with you all, business owners, fans of the NBA, NBA executives, managers, whoever it is, or you're assessing young people, wh- whatever it is that you're doing, make sure that you take the time and put together your strategy and your process for evaluating talent. And for those executives in the NBA who did that, hey, power to it and you're probably going to see the fruits of your labor here starting this season or over the next few years as these young guys that you drafted begin to to blossom and begin to flourish and begin to thrive in their situations some won't and that, that that's the risk that you take you know they talked about Michael Porter Jr. in his back things like that that's the risk you got to assess that you got to look at the medicals look at the medical professionals and you got to make a judgment call and listen, you're going to make bad calls sometimes. Even with doing it, you can do it perfect. You can do all, a lot of the best practices I've said, others have said, and it can still not pan out. You could, I mean, you know, if, if uh, the Cleveland had drafted LeBron James and uh, all of a sudden he blew out his knee in, in the first game or two or whatever, he had chronic knee problems, but, you know, he was like, um, what's the boy, uh, Greg Olden that was drafted in 07 where – yeah, well, of course, they knew he had issues. But let's just say LeBron James didn't pan out. Anybody would have probably selected LeBron James number one in 2003, right? So that happens. You can assess the talent and things like that. You just have to be able to learn and you have to do your very best. Doesn't mean everything's going to pan out. So don't beat yourself up over that. Learn from it. Get around the type of people that can help you be better so i hope today's show man was helpful man i'm, I'm thankful for this 50th episode champ ron the money your business podcast um check us out man www.mybpodcast.com uh, so www.mybpodcast.com uh check us out you can communicate with me on there check me out on facebook uh champ ron uh, i'm really looking to build the champ ron brand uh with my leadership and kind of business coaching and uh what i refer to as talent uh, grooming and engineering we're grooming champions baby so that's what i'm looking to do shout out Brittany thornton andrea what's going on uh miss wilson my cuzzo tiara what's up t lb what's got my guy Absalom Rogers, quad deep right there. That's quad deep blue fellas right there of one Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. Blue Phi, what's up, Go Mob? Asia, what's going on? I think Asia's out in South Carolina. So, what's up, lady? Glad that you could join. 
And, of course, I got my guy, Jamal Whitlow. So, anyway, man, thank you all so much for tuning in, man. Go enjoy the rest of your Friday. Man, take this. Think about it. Digest it over the weekend. If you got things to add, inbox me. Um, But let's get ready, you know, for next week. Enjoy the weekend with friends, family, whatever your positive endeavors are. If I can help you in any kind of way, man, communicate with me. That's what I love, love, love to do is help and see people be successful and however they define that in a positive manner. Champ Ron, the Mind Your Business podcast. I'll see y'all later, man. Y'all be as great as you can definitely be.